The Lord is here. Amen. Let's stand. I love looking out and seeing all the smiling faces. It is fantastic. And Michael Elder is here. Welcome. I'm so excited. You know what? It was a long time ago, it seems like. I handed him a set of bongos up here. And I said, here, let's start here. And by the time it all ended, I, I, how many instruments do you play now? <laughs> Five. And you know what? He gives God all the glory and praise. And I'll tell you, at that time, we had so many young people up here on the praise and worship team. I would just be like, hey, it's okay. I know you've never drummed before, but have a seat. Let's try it. And we, we had a lot of times of just jam sessions for Jesus. And I'll tell you what. When they began to just pick up an instrument that they had kind of dabbled with, the anointing just hit them. Real quick, if you ever think that God does not move with our young people, you're wrong. I know that right now we don't have an overabundance of youth, but I believe that that's about to change. Here in the last few weeks, I had, in, the last, in the last month, I was at some, some softball tournaments and we saw them gather together. And they said the, the Lord's Prayer, you know. And I thought, boy, it's amazing the power you can feel even with just the simple Lord's Prayer. And some of those kids never heard it or they didn't even know what it meant. But then I started seeing the football teams gathering together and they're kneeling and praying. And then all of a sudden, I got this vision of every, it's going to start with our sports teams because there's already a door open because it's the new thing to do. But Elena came up to me and said, hey, our team doesn't do that. Can, do you think our team can do that? So I talked to our coach who has Jesus as, a, as he grew up, he was in church. I, I went to church with him, we were young. But him and his family, they don't attend regularly now. But I say to him, you know what? I believe that a revival is about to start and it's gonna start in our youth program with the sports. I said, because when they come together and pray, they have a common bond. I said, but Elaine and I were talking, I said, we wanna do, do a prayer, but we wanna make it more personal. I said, we need to pray for the team. We need to pray for the coaches. We need to pray for the umpires. We need to pray for the stands, the people in the stands watching. I said, because we need grace and we need everybody to get along. Because sometimes in children's sports, it doesn't always go so smoothly. But I believe that the revival is about to start. And when I told him that, he says, I don't care if you want to pray, get it together, have her teach them, have her lead them. And he goes, and I believe it too. He goes, and I hope it happens soon. He got excited. But I believe that it's going to start with the sports programs and then it's just going to move out. So today, we're just going to, I just believe we're going to pray and we're going to go ahead and believe God for those things. I believe revival is going to hit and it's going to start with our young people first. So when Jesus said, bring, you know, come unto me, the little children, don't let them, be, don't let them be pushed away because some of those super spiritual people push those children back. There's been times I've had little babies that just want to kind of crawl up and I'm like, it's okay. Let me, I'll hold, I've, I've held babies while leading praise and worship. It's not me that they're being drawn to, it's the anointing. And Jesus did not push them away. If Jesus is not too good to hold a baby on his knee, than none of us should be. So I believe right now, let's pray in the name of Jesus. We pray that our children that are here will feel that anointing in their life and they will begin to sing songs unto you. Even as they begin to speak their first words, they will begin to praise you, Jesus. And when they are in the, in the presence of the Holy Spirit here, the Lord, that they, their lives will just be changed and they will begin to speak things and we will begin to hear words from heaven being spoken through our children and through our youth group and then through our millennials. Father, I pray that there is people the, those people that are unchurched that are in this city there are plenty of them that Lord we will draw in those young people that revival will begin with those young people Lord in the name of Jesus we call them in from the north the south the east and the west Holy Spirit rain down Holy Spirit rain down on our youth we pray for every school and every in the Christian schools even Father we just because they're in the Christian school doesn't mean that they know you so Father God 
God, we pray for revival to hit our schools in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way in this service today. With every word that we speak and every song that we sing, let your name be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name. And when the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will dance like David danced. Oh, when the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will dance like David danced.
serve a great God. We serve an almighty God.
How great Thou art How great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee How great Thou art How in this house, Lord, and we're not ashamed to lift our hands and to lift our voices today to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being our healer. Thank you for being our sustainer. Thank you for being the marriage saver. Thank you, Jesus, for being our constant companion. Thank you, Jesus, for being the reconciler of our families. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the God of all hope. today. Jesus, you do great things. You are a great and mighty God, and we exalt you today with uplifted hand and uplifted heart today, just to say thank you, Lord, for being there. Jesus, you said you'd never leave us or forsake us, and we believe you, and you've been there, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for that great faithfulness. Nothing, Jesus, is too difficult for you. Right now, God, we just invite you into every storm, every situation that's stretching us, every challenge financially, relationally, physically, spiritually. God, wherever people are today, right now, Jesus, we invite you in. We invite you to come, to fill our hearts, to fill that situation, to bring a breakthrough, God. We thank you that there is healing in your house, that when your people come together, there's an anointing, there's a power, God, that's present when your people come and pray. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you in. We pray for one another, our brothers and sisters. Today, may the power of God be released in the house. Today, may lives be touched. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. every life. Jesus, every person here is valuable to you. You died on the cross for their sins. Jesus, thank you for that great love. We worship you this morning, Lord. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. morning. The Holy Spirit's prompting you to share a scripture or a word from the Holy Spirit. Just, would you just speak that forth boldly today. We believe the Holy Spirit works through the gifts of 1 Corinthians 12. There's signs, wonders, there's, there's miracles, there's prophecies, there's tongues and interpretation. If you've got a word from the Lord today, just speak it out. something bigger than ourselves, 
a worldwide mission so that every single person can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we believe in missions. We thank you for our missionaries. We pray for them today on this Mission Sunday that they would be richly anointed, they would be encouraged, that they would know, God, that the folks back home have not forgotten them, that they're important to us and they're doing an incredible work. So God, we just thank you on this Mission Sunday for, for all those that are involved in far-flung corners of the world, bringing in the harvest of souls for Jesus. God, thank you now for this offering, for these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. If our ushers would come, we'll receive our offering. Jesus' name. Well, good to see you today. This is a, a beautiful Sunday, and uh, you've met it better by being here this morning. Uh, we've got something special to share with you, and so I'm going to ask Karen, there she is, if she would come, and uh, she's going to tell you about Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. And you all were a part of this over the summertime, and uh, so... Karen's got a great report, so I'm going to turn the mic over to her, and uh, you will be blessed. Hallelujah. Well, guys, this is it, our final report for the year for BGMCs. Now, if it were not for you, this report would not have been possible. With the nine children we have in our BGMC group, our $500 goal was a huge undertaking. That meant that each child would have to bring in at least $55. Well, virtually this would be impossible for some of our children. However, with your help, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and friends, we have literally blown the top off of our goal. Gentlemen. Drum roll. All the way from Colorado. 
$651.51. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you. We had a contest in place where prizes and awards would be given to those bringing in the most money toward our $500 goal. Anyone willing to help us with our goal could take a buddy barrel, take it home with them, fill it up as many times as they wanted, and I posted the names of the children who are in our class in the foyer, and if you so desired, you could give the monies you collected in the name of one or more of those children to support our goal. Also, the monies collected each Mission Sunday uh, that was not designated to any particular child or children would be split between all children present that week. If none of the children were present that Sunday, the money that was collected would be split evenly among all nine children. The first three collecting the most money would receive prizes or awards and awards for their hard work. Of course, all my children always receive something just for their participation. So kids, during our Sunday school time downstairs this morning, Mr. Gary and I will present you with your prizes and awards. But at this time, for those who helped us with our achievements, our family and friends, we would like to disclose the names of our winners. <clears throat> now, I said all that to say this. With the amount that you gave, first prize is going to go to Ashton Crumran with the amount of $141.98 toward our goal. <laughs> Terrific. Second and third places were extremely close, with second prize going to Alex Peach for his contribution of $97.26, and third prize is going to Connie Pinson for giving $97.23 toward our goal. Good job, Ashton, Alex, and Connie. And if anybody is interested, we'll have this posting right here in the foyer after church uh, with the amounts of the giving of each child in our BGMC goal, our group for your viewing. We also had a coloring contest for the children. There has been a poster covered with buddy barrels in the foyer for the past three weeks asking you to vote for the picture that you like the best. So first prize is going to go to Alex Peach for his Betty Barrel picture. And second prize will go to Skylar Milner for his Betty picture. Thank you guys for a job well done. And the children and I want to thank you all for your participation over the last six months in helping us with meet our mission's goal for BGMCs this year. You are a totally awesome family. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Karen. The love of missions growing among our young people because we want young people to catch a vision that Jesus has called all of us to reach the world, right? And so someday as these uh, kids get older, they'll be filling out faith promise cards and giving on a monthly basis because people like Karen and Gary instilled in them while they were young a passion for world evangelism. So this is a really important part of what we do at Eagle Mountain. $651.51 going to provide the tools that our missionaries need. That's printed material, uh, that's electronic material, and so it is a, an awesome blessing for our missionaries that BGMC provides these things. So uh, thank you to everybody that, uh, that gave and supported that. Now, I also want to mention concerning Gary and Karen, I never like to say this, but this is their last Sunday with us before they head to Texas. So, Gary and Karen, if you can still hear me, we don't want you to leave quickly today. We want you to stick around because we want to give you some hugs, and, and so uh, we miss them when they go to Texas for the winter, but uh, we know that they're probably making a smart move. 
So, uh, but we do miss them when they go. So make sure you give them uh, a little extra attention here before you leave the building today. Okay, we got some things coming up that, uh, that are in your bulletin. Just want to highlight a couple things. Our fall festival is coming up. Uh, it will be on the uh, 20th, one week from today. And we will be meeting out at uh, the Belaski home, Ed and Paula's home in rural Atwood. There's a map out here on the table. If you need a map to, you've never been out there before, we'd love to have you come and, and be a part of that. Uh, it starts at 4.30. We're going to do the candy hunt. The Bolton says, 515 we better really start at five or try to start at five to to make sure we've got enough daylight because i'd hate to be out there with a flashlight later looking for candy you know but uh, it's uh it's a great event and we have a chili contest and and last time i looked i was the only person signed up for the chili contest so here's what i'm thinking i think this year's chili contest we ought to have like a 200 hundred dollar prize and if I'm the only one that enters, then I'm going to pick out something really nice. No, we probably, <laughs> we probably won't, won't have it if I'm the only one that enters. But I, you know, my chili is, it's, you can beat me. I mean, I won last year. I'm not bragging. I'm in church. But, uh, you know, give me a run. Somebody take me up. We need at least three chilies to do our contest so uh, the sign up sheets on the foyer table but you need to sign up today okay because then I'm gonna be buying the prizes this week and uh, so I just need to know what what the, the future holds for that uh, again the fall festival great event invite some friends it's a great place for young people we're gonna have hot dogs and and uh, bonfire and just good fellowship it's a potluck style meal there's more details in the bulletin but that is next Next Sunday, uh, beginning at 4:30 at the Belaski home. Uh, missions emphasis is coming up on uh, November 3rd, uh, the first Sunday in November. We always try to have our missions emphasis, and uh, we've got Steve McMichael with us that morning. He is a missionary to North Africa, works among uh, the Muslim population. I think you'll find him very interesting, and uh, we'll be receiving our faith promises for 2020. And then after the service, we'll be moving downstairs to have our multicultural meal for those of you that like to. Uh, prepare ethnic food this is a great opportunity for you to uh, try your hand at some exotic dish although American dishes are more than welcome to uh, but we have a lot of fun with that there are some people who wear ethnic clothing uh, as kind of just to have the atmosphere going on so it's all about missions and uh, that'll come up on November 3rd uh, the Unity Men's Breakfast is, uh, is scheduled for the 26th. That's uh, two weeks from yesterday. And that's going to be a First Christian Church. This is kind of a new thing that's taken root over the last couple years. And we're trying to get men together from all the churches in the area as a demonstration of what Jesus prayed for in John 17. You remember what he prayed? He said, may they all be one, Father, even as we are one, that the world might know that you sent me. And so we are trying to bring the men together. We do about three of these breakfasts uh, a year. And uh, this one is going to be at First Christian, 7.30 in the morning on the 26th. There's a sign-up sheet back at the very back there. Uh, our task is to bring juice and um, something else, but it's back there on the sheet. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a great time. And uh, something different we're doing this year you know one of our vision goals as a church was to get together for kind of a, a community project and we're we're we're, we're starting out light but we are going to try to clean gutters for senior adults in the tuscola area for anybody that would like to after the breakfast you know there's people that should not be on a ladder right should not be out on a ladder and so we're uh, we're working on signing up people that would like to have a few men come together and clean out gutters and uh, just do that for Jesus maybe do some leaf raking and so if you'd like to be a part of that uh, you can sign up for that back there on the sheet as well but uh, anyway that's this first step of getting men working together I think God does great things when men come together and work
Thank you, Mary Ann. Appreciate that. My wife, I always count on her. God does good things when men get together and, and work, and so uh, I'm excited about that. Um, I do not recall the date, but this week, Becky Wax is having her back surgery. And so what, do you know, Tara, what the date is? Um, Thursday. Okay. Um, I, I will make you aware of this someday other than Thursday, but she's going down to St. Louis and having back surgery, and I know that Becky and Wally would greatly appreciate your prayers for that. Uh, that is a big, big undertaking, uh, but they found a doctor they really believe is going to be able to help. So we want to add our prayers to the prayers that have been going on for quite a while. So thank you for that. All right, we will dismiss our, our senior high and junior high students are going downstairs where Joyce is our teacher today. She's covering for Pastor Joel, who's with his family uh, up at Stone Creek this morning. So Joyce, thank you for teaching. And so junior high, senior high, go down, or, or go, yeah, go downstairs as well as our elementary and our preschool classes. So you may all be dismissed. It is a blessing to have uh, our son Michael here with us uh, this weekend. Did not know he was going to do a sneak drum roll in there. So uh, he comes in with a bang. I do remember the days when Michael played the bongo up there, and that was his start. And uh, he's an awesome musician now. We're very proud of him. And, enjoying some time with him. Uh, one of the things that uh, motivated Michael to come back here this weekend was that uh, Madeline Lorenz, you guys remember Carl and Tammy, uh, long-term parts of our church family, their daughter Madeline got married yesterday. And so uh, Michael went to, went to that wedding. So I believe that uh, Madeline and her new husband, Evan, are moving to Virginia. Uh, they're both in the science field, and so uh, uh, a time of transition for the Lorenz family. Well, last Sunday morning, I was preaching on hardship. Probably that was not a subject that is new to anybody here. We have all seen our share of hardship have we not health challenges money challenges dreams that don't work out all kinds of stuff that that just stretch us and challenge us and so the message that i preached last week was called lean into hardship leaning into hardship because a lot of times when it comes to hardship what do we do we're just like no i don't want that you know i but there's times, you know, you just can't stop a hardship from coming. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than your ability. That's why it's a hardship. And so the message was last week about how uh, just like Jesus leaned into the things that he, he suffered, you know, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Jesus never sinned, but he did suffer, right? He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And, and Jesus leaned into that, and he let the Father uh, teach him the, the value of obedience. And just like Jesus leaned into hardship, I believe that if we can look at hardship as not as something, well, what did I do wrong? You ever done that? You know, it's like, why me, Lord? What have I ever done? But instead to say, okay, Jesus, what are you doing? What do you want to teach me in this? What is the lesson for me to learn? So uh, that was kind of the message last week about how we, we develop uh, strength when, when times come along that, that challenge us and stretch us. You know, the Bible uses the imagery of, of running quite a bit. Any of you were are or were serious runners anybody here serious runners put my hand down <laughs> ron smith thank you for that hand back there I, all right we'll just leave that right there <laughs> you know they i had a, a preacher buddy say you know there's there's some cars that are built for speed and there's some cars that are built for comfort and he said i am definitely one of the comfort cars uh you know and i i get that uh i was at the nursing home uh last sunday 
and I always take the message from here and kind of take it there to share. And I told the folks uh, there at the nursing home, if you should ever see me running, you all better get up and start running too because something bad is going down. It's like, because this boy does not run unless something is really going down serious. So just don't do it. But you know, there is a race that we all run. There is a Christian race that we all run. We are in a race. And I love Hebrews chapter 12 uh, that it, it talks about how, you know, it's, it's right after chapter 11 where there's this, the great uh, cloud of witnesses, right? The people that, uh, you know, from, from Abel all the way down, people that served Jesus, people that loved God, and, and they persevered, and some had great triumphs, and some had deep sorrows. You know, sometimes it doesn't seem like life is fair. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And it's like, man, how come their life was so good? You know, I I can't explain it. I know it's been that way forever. You read Hebrews 11. Some, some got resurrected. Some suffered persecution. But all of it, in the end, those great cloud of witnesses are up in heaven cheering us on. And I love the imagery of Hebrews 12 where it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, right? Let us, let us throw off every hindrance and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. There's that imagery of running, that we are, we are pressing on, we're fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So if you are running a race, what is the most important thing? To finish, Mark. To finish. The most important thing point of running a race is to finish. How many of you saw the article about the, the, the guy this week that ran a marathon in under two hours? Anybody see that story? Broke the record. Yeah. Under two hours to run 26 miles. That is unfathomable. But I mean, it, it, it obviously broke a record in doing that. But the most important thing, you know, if, if you run 25 miles well, but if you fall on your face in the last mile, guess what? You don't make the news. Well, maybe you do, but not in a good way, right? You know, it's like, it's finishing. It's finishing that counts. It's finishing that determines winners from losers. It's finishing what you've started that it's all about. And so my message title this morning is Running Well. I want to challenge you up into, um, if you're not already doing the things I'm talking about this morning, to run this Christian race well. To make sure you finish. Because, you know, I think all of us have known people that have, they've, they've gotten excited They've, they've made a commitment, they've prayed a prayer, they've started attending church or got connected in a small group, and two, three, five, eight, ten years down the road, you're like, you know what happened to that guy that sat over there three rows back, about in the middle, where is that guy? Well, nobody knows. Last we heard, he started working Sundays and kind of got out of the church habit. And, and uh, then, you know, last time I saw him, you know, he didn't look real good. I asked him about where he was going to church and he kind of hem hawed around and, you know, and, right? I mean, that's, that's a story, isn't it? That we, we know people like that. People that started to run well. People that, that really had a vision for serving Jesus with their life, but they never finished. They never crossed the finish line. They've, they got detoured. They got sidetracked, right? And, and so this morning, I want to look at a passage of Scripture in, in Philippians where Paul talks about how important it is to really devote yourself to finishing the race. And so my text is found in Philippians uh, chapter 3 and the first verse of chapter 4. And uh, I want to give you just a little bit of uh, context on this here. You know, Paul was, uh, was a really religious man. And then he came to know Jesus. 
How many know there's a difference between being religious and knowing Jesus? You know, religion puts confidence in what you do, right? Do you keep the rules? Do you, do you wear the right clothes? Do you have the right look? Religion is all about what man does. But a relationship with Jesus is all about what Jesus does. And that's what's exciting, right? So Paul was a religious man, but then on the Damascus road, he met Jesus. And he's making the case here in Philippians chapter 3, which I, I might add, uh, you Bible scholars know this, he's writing this from prison. You know, that kind of gives you a little different perspective here. So here's a guy literally in chains writing this from prison and he's he's saying you know i used to put a lot of confidence in all my religious credentials all my righteousness that i achieved but he says verse 7 whatever was to my profit i now consider loss for the sake of christ what is more i consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing christ jesus my lord see he's saying here you know what all that religious stuff when I met Jesus, none of that stuff mattered. It all changed. So let's pick it up here now in verse 10. This is Paul's passion. This is his race. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection of the dead. Let me just pause there. Paul is saying, you know what, I... I don't just want to know about Jesus. And I don't just want to know the good stuff about Jesus. But he says, I want to know everything. I want to know what it's like to suffer for him. I want to know what it's like to be an overcomer, the power of his resurrection. Paul says, I want my life so connected with Jesus' life that I can even identify with Jesus' sacrificial death. And that's why Paul could write later on, he said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, right? Remember that, Galatians 2.20. So Paul is saying, my passion is to know Jesus. Now verse 12, not that I've already obtained all this. So he's saying, I've got a ways to go. Paul still had some rough edges. Anybody here got rough edges? Yeah, ask the person next to you, do I have any? Get ready for an honest answer. Yeah, Paul said, I've not already attained to all this. i got a few rough edges on me. I've got a few things that the Holy Spirit needs to sandpaper off. And, um, and so he says this. He says, I've not already been made perfect. He said, I'm not going to mislead you. I've, I've not perfected this, but I press on. See, there's the running imagery, right? I press on. I keep running, you might say, to take hold of that which, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, Paul was very single-minded. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Do you see the running imagery in that? Straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So this is the way Paul orders his life. He is a man on a mission. So he says, verse 15, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you, only let us live up to what we've already attained. Okay, so that's, that's, Paul's challenge. But now we're going to get to the nuts and bolts. What do you have to do to run well? Here he goes. Verse 17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say even again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But... Don't you love it when, when the scripture says, but? That means stop and think about this. But 
our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body therefore my brothers you whom I love and long for my joy and my crown this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. In other words, if you will do these things, you will run well and you will finish the race. I want to finish well. Do you, not, no, we don't want to be too morbid and think about this too long and hard, but you know, there's going to come a time if Jesus doesn't come back first that every one of us are going to get promoted out of here. And I do think sometimes, what will be said over my life? You know, I would sure hate for people to, to say, well, you know, Darren, yeah, he was a pretty strong Christian in his 30s and 40s, but, you know, he got old and he must have just got tired. You know, he, he, he just wasn't as enthusiastic about Jesus. He just kind of let it slip. You know what? That is not what I want said about me. I want people to say, man, that old man could preach. <laughs> not only did he preach, but he lived it. <laughs> right? You know, that's, 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 what I, that's what I want said, that, that I finished well. And so how do we do that? Well, there's three things real quickly here. I don't have Tony to help me this morning, but I think we can do this. First of all, if we're going to run well, we've got to partner with other strong runners. Thank you, Liz. That's a great graphic there of the track. That, that works. Partner with other strong runners. We see this in verse 17 where Paul says, join with others in following my example. Join with others. Connect with others other people now Paul's admitting his imperfection here and he's telling them yes take note of my example Paul lived what he preached but he's telling them that that it is important to connect with others if you're going to run well that word join I find myself using that in so many bulletin notes fellowship Come and join us. Small group, we'd love to have you join one of our groups. Men's breakfast, would you come and join us at 7.30? You know, I've, I've, I've looked up in the thesaurus different words to use for join. And it's just like, you know, <laughs> join just works. But you may get tired of, of seeing the word join in the bulletin. Now you're going to be conscious of that, aren't you? But I, I feel like there's just always a part of me that's saying, you know what? We need each other. Join us. Come be a part of this. Come connect with us. Be stronger with us. Lend us your strength. So I guess I'm saying that unabashedly, yeah, I do use the word join a lot because it is a Bible word. Join. Be a part of. And I know the culture today is really kind of running counter to joining anything. Did you know that church membership is really on the decline? People don't believe in joining a church anymore. Used to be, uh, some of us are a little older, it's like, well, joining the church was just a natural thing that you did. It was just a part. You became a member and you joined the church. Today, not so much. People are just kind of leery about joining things. Not that that's going to get you into heaven, but it's just an observation on culture that joining things is kind of looked at sideways. But it's a Bible word. Paul says, join with others. And I believe there's a reason. I believe we run better and we're safer when we're hanging out with the right people. I believe we run better. I believe we're safer when we are running the race with the right people. You know, sometimes I think everything I learned about spiritual warfare. How many of you know there is a, such a thing called spiritual warfare? We're, we are fighting the fight of faith, right? And there is a devil out there. The Bible says he's a what? He's a lion, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Sometimes I feel like I learned everything about spiritual warfare when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s on Sunday afternoons. I would watch a show called Wild 
Kingdom. How many of you watched Wild Kingdom when you were a kid? Wild Kingdom, buddy. Mar Marlon Perkins and watching Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And you'd watch that. You'd watch Disney. And, you know, that was just a part of the Sunday routine. That's the way it rolled as a kid. And, you know, they always had the exciting lion versus the, the antelope scene or the gazelle scene or the zebra scene, right? And, and so the lion would be crouching and sneaking up and he would suddenly pounce and the whole herd would take off and you know what I think I had a gift because I always knew which animal the lion was going to catch how many of you had the same gift which which animal was it that got caught the weak one that wasn't with the herd the one that was by itself, the one that was lagging behind. The, the animals in the herd were safe, but the animal that for whatever reason wasn't paying attention, had a bum leg, didn't have uh, good food, whatever it was, the one that lagged behind is the one that the devil caught. And you know, I think that nature teaches us spiritual lessons all the time. And I think that that is an important lesson for us. Paul says, don't be that one that's trying to do it by yourself. Don't think you are strong enough to run this race on your own. You need people with you. You need strong believers who support you, who will pray for you, who will be there when life gets hard. You know, you may think, well, I've been running by myself for a while. I think I'm doing okay. You get people in your life, it just complicates things. Yeah, it does complicate things a little bit, but the payoffs are better than the complications. Somebody say amen. Amen that there's something about running with people that are of like-minded and like faith and people that that are passionate about the same thing that that you are passionate about and so I just I would say to anybody that's like I don't know that I want to join anything I don't know if I want to get too connected to anybody you know you get too connected you just get hurt well if you're trying to do it by yourself you might get hurt too because there is a roaring lion out there and he's seeking whom he may devour so this word join is really your friend it is a call to connect with other people you know it's easier to stay motivated when you are accompanied by other people you just are can I can I say a word to our senior saints today we need you we need your example. We need your testimony. We need your prayers. Because you have run this race longer than we have. You are farther around that track than we are. And we need to see that you are still raising your hands in church. And you are still worshiping Jesus. Tom, I love the way you worship. Tom is, man, he's, he's into it. And it's like, man, don't his arms get tired? He's been doing that a long time. Nope, you know what? That's, that's Tom. And I love to see him worshiping Jesus. You know, there's something about uh, just seeing the, the, the senior saints faithful. They show up and they keep praying and they've got wise counsel. So seniors, can I just say, don't ever think that you are unimportant to the church of today because you are the church of today. And those of us that are a few steps or maybe laps behind you, we look to you, we respect you, and we need you. So thank you, thank you, thank you for showing us the way, for being an example, because we who are not as far along really need to see that Jesus is faithful all the way around the track. Somebody say amen. amen. God bless those senior saints. You know, Jesus called us to togetherness. And uh, the, the culture may say, you know, me and Jesus, we can do it. The Bible says you need to run with other people. Who do you think is right? I'm going to go with Jesus and not the culture. Amen? Amen? Okay. Now, let me just give you two little warnings here about uh, looking at other people. Don't ever put another person on a pedestal. You know what I mean by that? Putting them on a pedestal to say, now that is an example of a Christian, and my goodness, they, they just do it all right. And you know what? There, there is not one of us that does it all right. Okay, we, we've all got weak suits. 
And sometimes what we do is we'll, we'll get somebody and we'll say, now that is an example of a strong Christian. And then we catch them in something stupid. And we're like, well, you know what? I thought they were somebody I could ex respect and admire, and I guess they're not. And you know what? I guess I'm just going to not try to, to, to kind of be mentored by anybody. There's nobody perfect out there. Don't put anybody on a pedestal. Don't, don't look at anybody as, as perfect, uh, because they're not. I can tell you, I am absolutely far from perfect, and Marianne and, and Michael could talk to you after service, but they won't, about, you know, all the places where I fall short. You know, there's things I would love to have Michael imitate as my son, and then there's some things that I just really hope he does a whole lot better in than I did. Right? I'm running my race, but I want him to run faster and farther than I ever have, right? That's, that's what his parents, we want that for our kids and our grandkids. So the, the second warning is this, if somebody is looking to you as an example, they have paid you a huge compliment, do not be afraid of that. Because you might be thinking, oh, I don't want anybody looking at me because I've got so many holes. No, if they're looking at you and following you, you need to take that as a huge compliment and let that spur you on to be the best runner you can be. Now, let me quickly say, if you are a parent or a grandparent, you might as well accept the fact that people are watching you and they're taking their spiritual cues from you. Because the way you run the race is going to be what your children, especially, and maybe even your grandchildren, if they have enough exposure to you, you are going to be the norm for a born-again believer. Okay? Run the race well. You, with younger kids, you've got an opportunity to shape them in incredible ways, but they will not surpass the example that you set before them. Challenge them, challenge them to rise and be the best they can be and tell them that they can be even more than you are because I think that that's, that's an important part of it. Okay, so Paul said there's some people you need to look at. Secondly, he said there's some people that you need to ignore. Spectators. People that are not running. People that are just watching things. Who are these people? We see them in verses 18 and 19. Paul says, For as I've often told you before, and now say even again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. So Paul says, now, while you're running this race, there are people you need to absolutely look to, and there are people that can inspire you, but there is also a group of people that you need to turn a blind eye to. There are people that will absolutely discourage you if you focus on them too much. Now, who are these people? That's a great question, isn't it? Who are these people? Well, we know that these are not people who are in the world without Jesus. Does that make sense? Because if they were people in the world without Jesus, Paul would not need to say to the church, don't take your cues from lost people. Are you tracking with me? Paul would not need to say to the people that are running the Christian race, now don't look at people who don't know Jesus. No, what he's saying is, is that there are people in church who are not there for the same reason you are. And that's why Paul says, this hurts me even to say. He said, I'm telling you this, even with tears, that not everybody in church is in this to win it. There are people in church that are there for other reasons other than following, pursuing Jesus Christ. Whew, boy, that's kind of tough preaching, Pastor. It is, but it's true. I mean, I think we could all say, yeah, I've known people who, you know, they're, they're not there for the right reasons. They're not there to pursue Jesus. They're there to kind of have a form of godliness. They're there because it sometimes appeases their conscience. But they are really not dedicated to pursuing Jesus and running the race. Paul says those are the people that you cannot stop and look at. He says their, their God is their stomach. In fact, he, he's pretty harsh. And he says their destiny is destruction. Verse 19, these are people that aren't even going to go to heaven when they die. People in church? 
You know, Jesus didn't call us just to pray a prayer and then live any way we want to live. He called us to be his disciples, to be followers, people who, who leave the world behind, people who adopt a different set of values. And not everybody does that. They may come to church, but they are not passionate followers of Jesus. And, and they're, they're spectators. They may look like they're running. When I was in high school, I had a friend that worked at Steak and Shake. And back at Steak and Shake, back in the day, they had curb service. How many remember curb service at Steak and Shake? You could, you could pull up and somebody out there in the white, black checked outfit and little hat would come running out to your car and take your order and run back in. They don't do that anymore. But my friend was a Kirby. And, and I told him, dude, you have got perfected the run walk. He, he could make it look like he was running out to the car, but he was just walking. He would just be like, and I'm like, you know, he's given every impression that he's hustling for everything he's got. But the reality was he was just walking. And I think it's the, the kind of the same way spiritually that, that, you know, there's people that kind of give the impression I'm really running this thing. I'm really sacrificing for Jesus. I'm really taking my faith seriously. And the reality is, if you get right down to it, no, they're not necessarily. They may be religious, but they are really not pursuing a relationship with Jesus. Paul says, these are the people that you cannot get caught up in looking at. These are not the people that will inspire you to do your best. How do you know who's a runner and a spectator? Maybe that's the next question. How do you know who's a runner and who's a spectator? Well, Paul pretty well tells us. He says there in verse 19, their mind is on earthly things. Spectators are not thinking about the race and the goal. They are thinking about this earth. You know, there is a real tension, isn't there, between loving Jesus and loving the world. I, I love the creation that God's given me, but I have to really work to not get sucked into the way the world thinks. How many of you are with me? You know, it's, man, we are bombarded by media all the time, music and, and video and, and the internet and just wow tv we are bombarded and it's like you know what i don't want to get sucked into that it's kind of like eating a piece of chicken you like chicken do you eat the whole piece i don't know about you but i don't eat the bones right i'll, I'll eat the meat and i leave the bones behind and it's kind of like that with our culture there is some meat and if we can be discerning and, and eat the meat, but, you know, there are things we need to spit out. There's things that are just like, nope, not going there, not thinking like that, not listening to that, right? Not listening to that, not watching that. I'm, I'm, I'm not, that's not me. I'm running a race. I don't have time for that kind of thing. I have got bigger things in front of me. And so that's what Paul says. He says, if, you know, you've got to watch out for these people. They talk different. They spend time different. They spend their treasure differently. I have found if I look at spectators too long, I start getting discouraged. There's a pretty low bar today in America for what a Christian looks like. Oh, you've been to church? Oh, you're not a Muslim? Oh, you're not a Hindu? Oh, you're not a New Ager? You're not a Jew? You've been to church? You own a Bible? You're a Christian? No. No, you're not. A Christian is somebody who follows Christ, that follows Jesus. Right? We got a, this low bar of, you know, just, well, you listen to BGL, you must be a Christian. No. Although many Christians listen to BGL, but being a Christian is a, is a lifestyle, it's a change. So we gotta be careful of this very low bar that our culture has set for what it means to be a Christian. Lastly, how do we run a winning race? 
We got to remember that this life is a journey and it is not the destination. You know, Paul says to them in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Philippians would have understood this because they were, they were Roman citizens living in Greek land. They had a citizenship that was bequeathed to them as Roman citizens, even though they didn't live in Rome. It was part of having served in the army. And so, so uh, Philippi was a Roman colony. So the Philippians would have understood this about, I live in one place, but I'm a citizen in another place. Are you, are you with me on that? I live in one place, but I'm a citizen of another place. I live in the United States, but my citizenship is where? It's in heaven. Did you know there's not going to be any U.S. flags in heaven? I thought you were a patriot, Pastor Darren. I am. But that's only for time. In eternity, there's one king, and his name is Jesus. Right? I'm a U.S. citizen, but my citizenship ultimately is in heaven. And that's what Paul says to the Philippians. He said, you, if you're going to run well, you've got to remember where you're going. It's not about this life. It's about the next. It's about finishing strong. It's about having the testimony of Jesus on your lips. He said, one day this Jesus that you serve and chase after, one day he's going to come back and you're going to get changed. Our lowly bodies are going to be transformed and he's going to change us. I love this message. He's going to transform our lowly bodies. He's going to bring us home. But in the meantime, it is all right to be weird. I'm going to quote Dave Ramsey. It is okay to be weird. You know, and if you're a citizen of one country, you're going to feel odd in another country, right? I remember in my Navy days when I got to travel around a lot of places, you know, the, you might get away with, oh, well, you're kind of like us until you talked. And as soon as you talked, I remember being in England, they're like, oh, he's a yank. And it's like, how'd you know? Well, it's the accent, right? It's the American accent. You, it felt weird to be in a different country because... That wasn't my home. And it is okay to be weird here in America when we know that our citizenship is in heaven. Can I tell you, it, it is actually normal to be weird. I mean, if you're going to follow Jesus in this life, do you think Jesus is happy with all the stuff that goes on in American culture today? Do you, do you think Jesus is in, in favor of abortion? Then I'm going to go with, I'm not in favor of abortion either. And I'm going to follow Jesus. And people are going to say, well, dude, you are weird. And I'm going to say, you're absolutely right. Thank you for the compliment. Yeah, I'm following Jesus. You know, I'm going to follow Jesus in, in traditional marriage. I'm going to follow Jesus in, in, in modesty. I'm going to follow Jesus with, with what I do with my money. And if the world thinks that's weird, so be it. I really don't live here. I'm just passing through. I didn't come to stay. I am moving on. I've got, I've got a looking for a city, as, as the writer of Hebrews said. Looking for something more. I mean, how many times do we just feel that we don't fit here? We, we, we just don't fit. And the longer it goes, the more our culture drifts away from the Bible, the more we feel. I don't belong here. I'm out of step with my peers. I'm, you know, I'm different. I think different. I listen to different music. I read different stuff. I, it's just... It's not a fit, and you're exactly right. This world is not our home. We're passing through. And you know, the more we keep a hold of that, the more we're going to keep running. Because I'm not going to slow down for anything in this life. I'm going to keep pressing after what, what Christ, as Paul said, what Christ has taken hold of me for, and that is for heaven. So in this life, we're going to suffer some. In this life, there's going to be challenges. But I love that verse in 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says this, he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us 
an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know, it is easier to sit than run. How many of you have learned that? It is, it's just easier to sit and get comfortable. But that's not what we're called to do. We are called to run with perseverance, the race that is set before us. And we're not just called to just run, we're called to run well, to make sure we finish. And if we're going to finish, as the take-home tells us, we've got to find some other people that are running too. We need people in our corner that we can run with. We need a, a same-sex soulmate who can inspire us. Or if you're married and your spouse is a believer, that's wonderful. That's the best thing. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have Mary Ann. She helps keep me grounded. So, so we need somebody to run with. Um, we may need to put some blinders on. There may be some people that we need to look away from. People that aren't helping us follow Jesus. And then lastly, we got to remember where our home is. It's not here. There's going to be a place where we're going to see Jesus face to face. And it's going to be sweet. That's what we're running for. That's where we're headed. So today, I don't know where you are in this, this race of faith. you've got somebody you're running with I hope you've got another believer or several believers a small group of believers it'd be wonderful of people that are with you and helping you to run the race and I hope that you're being careful about who you look at and I hope today that that you've got the excitement of I'm heading home Jesus. No place like home. Click your ruby slippers. No place like home. No place like home. We're going to be there one day. We're going to see Jesus. It may be quicker than what we even imagine. But we want to go out running. Running for Jesus. I'm going to ask all of you to stand, please. How are you doing today? Wish I could sit down with every one of you and say, okay, so how's your race going? How's your race going? Are you, are you, are you running? Are you distracted? Are you discouraged? Are you, are you facing hardships? How can I come alongside you? How can I pray for you? I wish I could do that for every one of you because as your pastor, I, I feel a, a sense of spiritual responsibility because personally it's one of my goals that when I get to heaven, I see every one of you there. Somebody could have said amen there. Um, you know, I, I want to see all of you there. I want to I want to see you guys there, that you finished well, that you fought the good fight, you've kept the faith, you've finished the race, right? I, that's part of the joy, is to see all of you there. And I want to do everything I can to make sure you are running well. So I'm going to just say, would Pastor Darren, I could just use a little extra prayer in my race today. Just lift a hand. I could use a little extra prayer. I'm going to pray for you, okay? I'm seeing, seeing hands multiple places. All right. Father God, I pray that every uplifted hand today, Father God, that people that just need an extra boost in their, in their step, Father God, I pray that you would just